what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3. Since you have been raised with Christ, whoo, anybody yeah. in resurrection life? Yeah. Yeah. If you're not yet, we invite you to join us. Yeah. Set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above. So hearts on things above, minds on things above. Not on earthly things. It says, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Ooh. Christ who is your life. Yeah. Appears. Then you also will appear with him in glory. He's not going to leave any of you out. Amen. Yeah. My message this morning is, what you looking at? You ever heard anybody say that? Or you said it to somebody? Because you think somebody's staring at you? Sometimes there's reasons they're staring at you. You know? But as we look at this passage, the first point is looking up. You gotta look up first. You gotta set your heart, your mind on the king and the kingdom. There's a kingdom now, and then there's the kingdom to come. And we're living the kingdom now, but there's much more to come. Amen. Don't miss out on whatever Jesus the King has for you now. In His kingdom process, in His kingdom work, in His kingdom heart for people. Walk with the King now. Walk in the kingdom life now. And later, you're just going to walk right into eternity, into that kingdom and the fullness. Yes. It says, in that day, we will see Him like He sees us. We will know Him like He knows us. And we have that hope. And it says in 1 John 3, we have that hope that it purifies us even as He is pure because of our hope for God. Bible says in Hebrews 12, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He got you rolling. He'll keep you rolling. You just have to keep your eyes on Him. He'll finish the work if you don't jackrabbit out of the situation. He will stabilize us. He will point us the right direction. He'll give us gas in the tank. And I don't just mean in your vehicle. Give you the power, give the energy to keep on going until whatever God has for you in this life is finished to the glory of God. Amen. So first of all, we have to look up. Secondly, we have to look out. We have to look out. In other words, instead of being navel gazers, <laughs> if you're not familiar with that term, that's somebody that's always looking down like that at their belly button. <laughs> It's all about me. Me, 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 me. I know sometimes we're pretty broken and we got some things going on and we have to deal with some responsibilities and so on. But don't forget about those who are around you. You know what I mean? Matthew 25, Jesus talked about some people, sheep and goats. And at some time, there's going to be a separation between the sheep and the goats. Now, if you're a goat now, let's hope you get to be a sheep before Jesus comes along and sorts the thing out. It says in the end time, He's going to sort it out. What was the difference between the sheep and the goats? The goats didn't even notice that there was people with needs around. I ah, mind my own business. I don't have to pull that. They don't even notice that there's needs around them. Either deny it or ignore it or whatever. They're too distracted about other things. He said, that was me you missed out on. You could have helped. It's pretty simple. Find a need. you got to be looking for one. Find a need and meet it. Find a hurt and heal it. That was an expression or phrase from the ministry that started a, a, a huge church down in California. That's how they got started with just a little group. They just were looking for somebody to help 
and somebody had a need to see if they had something they could do about it. And what turned out, they discovered there were a lot of young families in the area with a lot of kids. And so they started a study and a gathering of the mothers and people that were available, gathering them together and help them with uh, uh, how to raise children and what the Bible says about that kind of stuff. That's how they started because it was a big need. See, uh, we've been talking about how the world is on a downward spiral into darkness. And how we're to shine our light. Not just point out the darkness. That's pretty simple. Anybody can do that. There's darkness all around us. But the world is kind of like the Titanic. You know, the guy that built it, funded it, whatever, thought it was unsinkable. It went down on its maiden voyage. First time it went out, hit an iceberg. So they're real cocky about it. So the guy who paid for it, I forget his name, he was on board. He was the first one to get in the lifeboat. By the way, I just watched a little thing about the, that cruise ship that tipped over and, and a lot of people got off, but some died. You know who the first guy out, out of there in the lifeboat was? The captain. He accidentally fell into a lifeboat. That's what he said. That was his excuse. <laughs> captain is supposed to go down with a ship. Yeah. Looking out for other people and so uh, some people who were playing in the band, the band made a decision, we're just going to play. They played until the thing sank. They gave up their life jackets and, and their spot in the boat. In the same way with the preacher. So he just preached until the last soul surrendered or not. Because everybody has to make a decision. Some people gave their life to Christ in that crisis, and some didn't. But he went down with the ship, and the band went down with the ship. And I guess the application is, we're just going to keep praising God and playing music for Jesus. And if the world goes down like the fight thing, helping people. We're going to keep reaching out with the gospel because it's the power of God Amen. and the salvation to everyone who believes, even the last second. You know, my, my daughter was talking about the Muslims and we watched a little thing the other day about this lady during the Iraq war. Uh, she was taught all of her life to hate Christians, that Christians hated them and wanted to kill them and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, but she, she was in a family with 10 kids and she had learned English in college and so she was an interpreter for NBC and uh, there was one, I'm trying to keep the story short, but there was one uh, guy who worked for NBC named Don Teague, which is my son's name, it wasn't him, but <laughs> that's how I remember it. But uh, at the last minute, she was asked to come with them to interpret because there had been a brand new school built and it was going good and that. And she came there to translate for them. And right at the last uh, interview with the principal and the mayor and that, there was a huge bomb the terrorists set off. And she was just frozen. They all ran for cover, but her, usually they'd blow up the bomb and they start shooting. And so they were all like diving for cover. Totally unexpected situation. Don T gave her his flak jacket, his bulletproof vest, because she had, it was the last minute she left hers back in her room. That act of kindness and self-sacrifice Turned her whole attitude around about these people she was taught was her enemies. The only reason she worked for her enemies was because to feed those ten kids, because they had no they had no money and no job in the house. It just totally changed her attitude. God worked a miracle later because she was she was considered a traitor just for translating in the English, and she got a visa to the States when nobody from Iraq was in the visa from the States and she was with the Christian family and she ended up giving her life to Christ. Look it out. Look up first. Look out. The world is spiraling downward and I can be a positive influence 
on one or more other people that I'm around. Might be somebody in a thrift store, the drug store. Might be somebody in Fred Meyer. Might be somebody you work with, whatever it is. We went to Tractor Supply the other day. Didn't find what we were looking for. There was actually two vehicles there done, yeah. two different missions. Didn't find what we look, were looking for. But as we were coming back to the car, Mike and I mentioned that, uh, oh yeah, um, uh, Skipworth's saw shop closed down. And this lady who was coming up there said, he did, he just fixed my chainsaw a couple months ago. He had a wheelbarrow with, or a cart or whatever it was with a couple of big sacks that we unloaded that in the trunk. And uh, she was talking to us, and she said, well, I'm an atheist, but you guys do super work around here. I see your crews everywhere, and you do the most wonderful work, and I just want to commend you and say, hey, you just got to keep it up, you know. She's telling us about some of her relatives who are in recovery, and she was just all thrilled, even though she was an atheist. <laughs> wow. Most atheists aren't real atheists anyway. They're what's called agnostics, which means it's sort of like maybe there is a God, but he's a long ways away or don't care or whatever they don't think. God is not in their thoughts. But because of the light in our lives, whatever we're doing and saying and helping in our hearts for God and for people, that's a testimony that can be, bring people to Christ. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Looking up, looking out, and then looking in. You know, some people start looking in. One thing that kind of bugs me, I've heard it so many times. Jesus said, there's two commandments. Love God with all you have. And love your neighbor as your own self. So people start with, well, you can't love God or your neighbor unless you love yourself. That's the third one. No, Jesus said there's two. All I know is most people I know that ever started with loving themselves never got to Jesus and never got to other people. Love God with all you got. Love your neighbor as yourself. And at some point, that whole process starts to work within you. Yeah. You know, we all have some degree of self-hatred. Part of it is just because we know that all of sin comes short. And why did I do so many things wrong or not do so many things right? There's this nagging thing called conscience God's given us. <laughs> Amen? So we all need things. We all know things need to get squared up. <laughs> so we we do have to look within. Huh? Over here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 9. I'm skipping 5 to 8. You'll be thankful because there's a whole list of stuff you could work on. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> verse 9 says, Do not lie, and lie to each other. That's a good start anyway. Since you have taken off the old self yes. with its practices and have put on the new self. Yeah. <laughs> taken off the old, put on the new. Two different things, right? Yes. The old garment, the old behavior, the old mentality. We've got to put it off by the grace of God, recognizing, you know, that kind of sucks. I kind of suck. <laughs> My attitude sucks right now. I hope, I mean, I say that just about every day. My attitude sucks right now. Okay, Lord, I repent. <laughs> Sometimes it just takes a minute and the attitude changes. Right. Amen. God. I gotta touch. I gotta touch. <laughs> And sometimes I gotta really pray it through and pout a little bit and walk around a little bit. <laughs> Not you, I know. <laughs> put off the old, put on the new. What's the new look like? It's being renewed. That's the Holy Spirit. Hey, if God loves me, then I better start loving myself. Cut out the bad self-talk. That's old behavior. Right. That's the old self. 
Resist the accusations of the enemy. I don't care what the devil says about you. I only believe what God says about you. I don't care what your ex-wife says about you. I only believe what God says about you. <laughs> Take off the old behavior and the old attitudes. Put on the new stuff. It's like Jesus. Amen? In that process, you learn what triggers those attitudes and those actions. Sometimes we get a little grumpy because we project stuff on other people when they didn't do anything. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But put on the new. God challenged Abraham in Genesis 17, 1, walk before me and be perfect. 99 years old. Walk before me. And it really has to do with, with uh, maturity or what the translation says, blameless. Walk before me and be blameless. So if you're looking for perfection, I don't know if you've had a perfect day, but I don't, I, I mean, I've said that. <laughs> Wow, this day was perfect. But those are few and far between because usually they're a mixture. Some of the times there's, there's a lot of good stuff and then a few bad things, you know. Or a lot of crap and then there's some good and, you know. But perfection is not about a perfect walk and a perfect talk. It's about a maturity that God works in your life, your spiritual life, till you get a solid foundation enough, a sustainable foundation to where you recognize things that trigger your attitude or trigger your anger or trigger something. You know, and you recognize it. And then you deal with it more clearly. That's The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, let us go on to perfection, it says in King James. But it really means going on to maturity, not laying again the foundation. And then it's got a list of things that you can study out. A lot of people don't even go that far to get, get a foundational understanding of God and His Word. But if you get that down solid, then other things start building. Jesus told that story about the person who heard the Word of God huh? and then obeyed the Word of God. But that was a firm foundation. It's one thing to be listening and to hear the Word of God, whether when you're reading or you're praying or whatever, or when you're listening to a message like this, but it's another thing to then go, I'm doing it. Yeah. By the grace of God, I'm doing it. And then walking out the door and doing it. Yeah. Instead of walking out the door. <laughs> <laughs> So some people, very few, but somebody, first of all, they make an excuse. Nobody's perfect. That's the lamest excuse I've ever heard for doing the wrong thing. Seriously, quit saying that. You know, just go, man, I'm sorry. Or, uh, yeah, that was a bad choice. Or say something else besides, well, nobody's perfect. Sean. <laughs> but then there's some people that think they're perfect, Christian or not. <laughs> Speak to them and say, um, okay, smarty pants, if you think you're perfect, check out verses 5 to 8. It'll give you something to work on. We're a new creation, verse 11. Yeah. I'm going to finish up here. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. For believers, it really levels the whole thing. Amen? The new creation life is not about nationality. 
race, education, or economic status. It doesn't matter. It's not about male or female. You know, by the way, I'm proud to be an American. I don't care what anybody else says. Amen. When I get off that plane from coming overseas, I want to be like the Pope and just kiss the ground. <laughs> when you go through customs and all that, the guy goes, Welcome home! In English! <laughs> you know? I'm glad to be an American, but nationalism really didn't start until about the 1800s. 150 years or so ago. All this nice stuff, right? If you check out, it was more tribalism and areas held by kingdoms and all this stuff that overlaps and and uh, nations were created all along the line and then now we're supposed to wave these flags and, and wear these medallions and stuff like that. And like I say, I'm proud to be an American and fly the flag and all that stuff. But it's not about, oh, what's that, the communist flag? What's that, the whatever? Who are you? You're a what? You speak what? No, we're better than you. No, we're not. Because in Christ, and the gospel works in every culture, every nation, every language, it works just the same. You give them a good, straight gospel about Jesus Christ, Him raised from the dead. He is God, and His blood cleanses from sin. And you give them a good, straight gospel, and all of a sudden, <laughs> what happened? I don't know. It's supernatural. The Savior touches another heart that comes to have heaven with us. The gospel works. A lot of the stuff we think is important, you try to export it to some other country, and they're like, what? What are you talking about? It doesn't work, some of our American Christianity, but the Word of God works. Amen. The seed of the Word works. Amen? Amen? So as we're looking up and looking out, checking ourselves, you know, don't spend all your time just checking yourself, because I tell you, you dig far enough to find dirt every time, and then you'll be moping around about what a jerk you are. <laughs> And then you'll forget about God, and then you'll forget about helping you. I just could never help anybody. I don't have any money. I don't have any smarts. I don't know my Bible forward and backwards. <laughs> Let God transform you into a person like Jesus in the Gospels. You don't want to know where He's taking you? He's taking you from glory to glory in His presence. And you, you read those Gospels and say, Wow, well, that isn't me, but that's where God's taken me. Amen. Christ is in all, and Christ is all. Will you stand with me? Lord, my eyes are on you. Lord, my eyes are on you. I set my heart and my mind on you. I set my heart and my mind on your kingdom. I make you and the kingdom my first priority. I know there are other things that are important, but I put you first. Give me eyes to see the needs of others. Put resources in my hands so I can meet the needs of others. Give me a heart for the brokenhearted. Give me a heart for the broken heart. Give me a heart that makes me a helper and a healer. Give me a heart that makes me a helper and a healer. I put off the old me. I put off the old me. I put on the new me this morning. I put on the new me this morning. Change my heart, O oh God. Change my heart, O oh God. Make me more like you. Make me more like you. 